Hello, everyone. We hope you're all taking care of yourselves and are well. Um, this is Jean-Yves Gomelon and uh, Professor Starbird. We are going to make a short presentation of the heat exchanger experiment uh, today. Heat exchangers are extremely common. They are used everywhere in the marine and industrial environments. And uh, they come under a lot of flavors and shapes. Here is, for example, a tubular heat exchanger, a large one. You got here a plate heat exchanger, another plate heat exchanger here. Here is a tubular heat exchanger, which is apparently a condenser. And here you've got a, an evaporator, which is likely being used in a uh, HVAC uh, function. Um, they, this is another plate, heat exchanger. We talked about the Kegel cooler cooling down the main engine or auxiliary engines and smaller vessels generally and also that intercooler which is widely used uh, on engines and the, uh, this intercooler is also obviously a heat exchanger. Some of the uh, ships and rigs, power plants, on which uh, you have hundreds of heat exchangers. And what are the main applications on ships? There are many, many applications. Um, here's a list of some of the applications, but there are others. Um, it's widely used on propulsion plants to uh, cool down the lube oil or um, engine uh, water cooling. Um, it's also used on auxiliary power generation systems, air systems, um, fuel oil. When you use heavy fuel oil, you need to make sure the viscosity of the fuel is is constant and for that you are uh, sending the fuel oil through heat exchangers in order to heat it up to a point where the viscosity is is acceptable. Uh, refrigeration systems are made of uh, heat exchange units, AC units, uh, some tankers, gas tankers, you've got gas relification um, steam plants have got tons of many, many heat exchangers and so on. So the heat exchangers generally used are recuperative heat exchangers as opposed to regenerative. Uh, we are not going to describe the regenerative heat exchanger. You can do your own research. Um, it's another kind of heat exchangers, but our focus today is recuperative heat exchangers. And the most popular designs of all those recuperative heat exchangers are the shell and tube heat exchangers. And just followed by the plate heat exchangers. If you've been on the state of Maine, which certainly did, you have noticed the number of heat exchangers that they be shell and tube or uh, plate heat exchangers. Here's the uh, other practical industrial example is uh, name, this is a nameplate on, on a uh, plate heat exchanger and you can see those but the information on this type of plate is you have the heat surface, exchange surface, total heat exchange surface, the capacity, exchange capacity expressed in kilowatts, 
Then you got the flow liters per hour, uh, which is the capacity in terms of flow of the heat exchanger. Then you've got indications like max working pressure. You don't want to put too much pressure in a plate exchanger because you see the design is made of uh, plates that are stuck against each other and separated by uh, uh, gaskets, uh, too much pressure will generate leaks and all sorts of issues. So it also indicates what uh, the volume of fluid on one side, here called the product side, and on the other side is here you've got uh, uh, the whole volume that that is trapped into the heat exchanger here is like uh, 139 liters, for example, and they also here indicate what the max working temperature is. Here zero degrees, freezing point here is um, 110 degrees, it's what they ever is the max that can accept, again, also related to the nature of the gaskets, which are neutral, butyl, etc., some of them. So they, they all have a, a temperature limit depending on their nature. Oops. Here is a heat exchange specification sheet example. Um, this is what uh, what the designer would would um, would send to um, a manufacturer. Of this. Uh, of uh, heat exchanger and this will remain in the uh, the general technical specification files of the heat exchanger and so this is what is expected here so you see you've got two the two sides are described here shell side tube side and here the first uh, line is uh, what is are we supposed to to uh, handle in this heat exchanger here is hot water here is cold water so on the shell side and on the tube side then you need to tell how much um you know flow you want and it expressed in kilograms per hour so here are the values that uh, uh we need to we want to send through that uh shell side and tube side and the nature of the water etc temperature specific gravity uh, of the fluid so it's water hot water okay cold water so you see there is a slight difference of specific gravity and viscosity of the water uh, here you got the specific heat indicated here, thermal conductivity. We'll see what that is later. The pressure, velocity of the fluid as well, pressure drop allowance, and that's also obviously related. It's, it's within a, a system, you know, where you have pumps and uh, valves, etc. So uh, um, it's extremely important to deal with, to provide a, a maximum allowable uh, pressure drop. Um, so, for example, a pump uh, can be properly sized with a head and uh, uh, NPSH flow, etc. Footing resistance is another important uh, uh, aspect here, um, where the heat exchangers are not used in a um, uh, it's not the perfect world. So if you, for example, take a, um, a seawater to freshwater heat exchanger, um, it's it's going to be to get dirty uh, and quite quickly. And it needs, by the way, to be periodically uh, clean. So they, you need to build in some factor uh, in your heat exchanger so it doesn't reflect a, an ideal situation, but uh, so an average working realistic um, t uh, operation. Transfer rate is indicated here, etc. So, well, 
there are many, many different types of uh, heat exchangers. They, the two main families are recuperative and regenerative, here and here. And we are, again, not going to talk about the regenerative heat exchanger, but focus on the recuperative. And our uh, lab today is about the tubular heat exchanger, indirect type. The experiment. What we are going to do is uh, focus on a shell and tube heat exchanger again, nothing else. And um, this is a, an extremely classic experiment and many, many engineers, myself included, went through that, that type of, in, uh, that type of, of uh, training. The, uh, it's, um, it's uh, this one, the one we are dealing with today is the simplest possible form of a heat exchanger. It has two tubes, concentric tubes, carrying hot and cold fluid water, actually. And uh, we'll uh, look at this here on the next slide. And you see this is what I was saying, it's extremely simple. You've got two fluids, two, I'm sorry, two tubes, um, concentric tubes. And here you've got one fluid coming in and out. And here, the second fluid, the hot and the cold or vice versa, whatever you decide. Um, so um, there are two main ways uh, these two fluids, one and two, can, can circulate. Uh, they can uh, circulate in the same direction, or they can, one can circulate like this, and the other one like that. Uh, so, when they circulate in the same direction, like here, uh, you see the two fluids are going in the same direction, it's called parallel flow. And when they circulate in and opposite direction, it's called counter flow or reverse flow. There is a third type of, of flow, we are not going to talk about that today, but you can do some research, it's a cross flow. So uh, what, what are we looking to achieve here with this experiment? Well, we are going to deal with this parallel versus reverse or counter flow, parallel versus, versus counter flow configurations. And we want to see um, what happens when we uh, uh, switch the operating mode from parallel to reverse or counter flow. Uh, is there any difference? Is the uh, heat exchanger performing better or not that's good? Um, and so, in other words, the uh, um, the respective efficiencies and temperature profile may be different and will be different and they both present advantages and disadvantages depending on um, what the heat exchanger is being used for, what sort of application. So then, well, knowing these advantages and disadvantages, um, we need to find, well, we, we, we know we will see that one mode is being used more than the other one, and why, why that? And you will see it relates to efficiency and other, uh, other aspects. And we'll talk some in the, in the next slides, we'll talk about the, that heat transfer coefficient U. That's one is kind of important to understand. Um, will this U be different between the two modes? And this is what we want you today to analyze and discuss um, throughout this experiment. Now, why 
Will this lab be useful to you in, in the future? It will first, uh, even though we are dealing with uh, um, relatively simple heat exchanger or the simplest form of heat exchanger, it will provide you with a very good understanding of the physical and mechanical principles of what heat exchange is. And you should develop your uh, tools that uh, would allow you to troubleshoot issues. If you don't design systems, well, there are um, many times where you will uh, have as an engineer to troubleshoot with the, well, some issues here. It could be during startup, um, the heat exchanger is not connected properly. They inverted the inlet and the outlet, or it gets dirty um, and performances are, are uh, going down. All sorts of reasons why, uh, you know, what you will see today will uh, make you think um, properly regarding the, the reason why our system doesn't work or you will also be able to, uh, for some of you who decide to do that, to go to the design level for equipment. And that's a very good first step. I mean, what we see here is going to be applied to, uh, to the rest, um, to any sort of heat exchanger, really. Um, here is uh, an important concept regarding heat exchangers. Uh, efficiency. What is efficiency of a heat exchanger or a machine in general? It's a comparison between the actual and the ideal performances. And it's generally best less than, uh, than 100%. It could be uh, 80%, 60%, 40%. 100% would be uh, perfect. And uh, you really can never reach 100% efficiency for a heat exchanger or you will have an uh, infinite exchange area. Uh, it would not be uh, economically feasible. And uh, well, here also um, we are going at, through this experiment, you know, parallel flow versus counter flow, we're going to see which mode has the highest efficiency. There are uh, formulas like every, every time we deal with thermal um, uh, fluids, uh, thermal um, engineering, um, but there are two main formulas and hopefully these can be uh, you know these, you've seen that before, I'm sure, but these uh, formulas can um, are those two that every engineer um, keeps in mind during all his career, all his life. Uh, so that first formula here is uh, uh, what you see, it's energy, that's uh, the uh, energy transferred and here is a that's a transfer rate and it's expressed in joules or in kilowatts mostly in kilowatts and this is transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate of the water in our case multiplied by uh, the specific heat and multiply the difference of temperature between the uh, inlet and the outlet. The second formula is the one shown here. And it's also the heat transfer rate, kilowatt. And this one is equal that heat transfer rate to the famous U. And again, we are going to talk about that U in a moment. 
multiply by the total heat transfer area. And by the way, when you do your calculation, remember we have two lengths of tubes and that heat transfer area is expressed in um, square meters. And you've got um, a log mean temperature difference here. And we look at how this is calculated. A little sketch regarding the wall, well, the, the pipe system, the heat exchanger we are going to use. And this is all about explaining right now, and there will be a few slides about that. But bear with it, because that's important to understand. It's uh, what is the, um, what is that uh, overall heat transfer coefficient to you? What is it? And this is that one here. You can see in that the second formula that we would need to use today. So U is a measure of how well the heat is transferred from one fluid to the other through the pipe wall. Here the pipe wall and you see the hot water side here flowing inside that tube, the inner tube, and cold water here. And I indicated here, you see there are all sorts of things happening here. You've got uh, some conduction and you've got some convection. We are going to look at that. And I'm sure you heard about all this before, but let's have a look at it. So. Now, still trying to understand what that overall heat transfer coefficient U is about. Uh, let's see what uh, what it, it is depending on. It's depending on uh, the here on that graph. It's depending on the convection. It's depending on the conductivity and uh, the surface fooling, like imagine you have scaling in, uh, inside the pan here on, on, the, on the walls of the pan that's, that would be falling. Um, and will you be affected by the type of flow, parallel or counter flow? Let's talk a little bit about convection, conduction and radiation uh, more in depth. There are three types of uh, heat transfer. You've got the conduction. Here's a, a little sketch showing what uh, conduction is about. It's a movement of heat by a molecular transfer. It's this uh, what you feel on the on a poorly isolated pan handle. When it becomes too heat, it's conduction. And it's a molecular transfer. You see heat is applied here, and so all the molecules start vibrating until uh, and they change energy level. And then you've got a second one, which is a convection. It's um, That one is a movement of heat by mass transport. And you can see what the convection is here. Convection is also used for uh, home heating when you've got hot pipes and uh, we the air is naturally it's a natural convection. The cold air goes through the um, the hot pipes, generally water, and then it's heated up, goes up to the ceiling, cools down, goes down, and and gets back into the the hot pipes to be heated again. And the third one is the radiation. Well, we are not uh, going to deal with radiation, really, uh, calculation <clears throat> in that heat exchanger, but there is obviously radiation as well. Um, and that's a movement of heat by uh, electronic, electromagnetic waves. It's the sun, or you see on that sketch here, the sun, or you're near a, a, a wood fire and you you feel the the heat um, here 
Um, but the very important thing here is that um, when you have a heat transfer, the total energy transferred, <clears throat> Q total here, is equal to uh, uh, the energy through conduction, energy through convection, plus energy through radiation. So this is um, all that that is happening, and uh, this is good to remember uh, when you go through, um, you know, a wall, say, that's Q, Q total, and you go through all those walls, you go through, so you're going through the pipe wall, this is conduction, uh, convection here, those blue lines, so it's going through that as well, um, jumping hoops, and the, um, and radiation, uh, there is uh, some radiation going through that as well, so that Q total is all those different Qs, um, the three different Qs added to, together. Now we keep on discussing about that U coefficient and what's impacting that U coefficient. Um, first, the conduction, more in-depth information about the conduction. Um, and a practical example, it could be a cold storage or a house. Anyway, you've got, if you look at that sketch here, you've got a concrete wall and you've got insulation. And here is the temperature, you got 300K Kelvin, so you can 300 Kelvin, and the, you got 250 Kelvin outside, inside, outside. So, they, obviously there is energy transfer. Nothing is perfect, you can isolate a room as well as you can, you will always have some some more losses and a queue going through uh, the wall. <clears throat> so that, yeah, that line here is the temperature distribution. And um, again, like we saw just before, Q, well, we didn't see that exactly the same way, but that's conservation of energy. That Q here is uh, the Q that goes through the concrete. You saw the Q that goes through that. It's like going through. So it's the same amount of energy that goes wherever the material is, goes through the concrete or goes through the insulation. Um, here we've got, you can see this is, this is a slope here and another one here. So there is a temperature drop that you see here with a slope in the concrete and another one here. And you see that slope here, and that number, or that uh, symbol K, K is the thermal conductivity of the material. So, you know, considering this equation, Q concrete, Q isolation, the uh, equation you have here is that slope, delta T concrete over L, which is the weight of the concrete wall, so the slope delta T divided by L multiplied by the thermal conductivity of the concrete. And it's equal to the slope you see here multiplied by the thermal conductivity of that material, which is some insulation foam or whatever insulation material it is. So you see the large slope here, big slope, small slope. So to provide a 
good isolation, insulation. You need to have that factor as large as possible, that one as small as possible, and that one here for the insulation as small, must be small, and the slope must be important, which we have here. We provided separately the PowerPoint, so if you want to spend more time um, also looking at that particular slide, or ask question if you have any doubt. But there are ways to properly insulate and ways not to properly insulate, and uh, the proper insulation rules are these equation indicated with this equation here. And thermal conductivity, uh, as I mentioned, depends on the material. So here I, we put some, like for example, in it, you just open a book with, or look in the internet at material tables, and you will see that uh, the, for example, for the concrete here, uh, it's 0.8 watt per meter Kelvin. Now convection. Convection is, is a heat transfer, uh, the transfer of heat from one place to another by the movement of fluid, the displacement of the mass here. You can see in the pan. Uh, and here is a formula for um, the heat transfer. Here's the same Q. Um, and it's, uh, you look at, you can see that equation here, where uh, T is the uh, temperature of the object, and here it would be water, and T, infinite T, is the surroundings, the air around here. Um, H is a coefficient that uh, we can find on tables for certain conditions. This is an example following that slide, and A is the uh, area of transfer, uh, which is uh, in, um, square meters. And you can see here is that H, which is empirical, depends on the temperature uh, in, of the object, the uh, temperature of the surroundings, the viscosity of the fluid, etc., and the, uh, and the uh, K of the fluid. And the uh, um, here is a, a table. You see there are a number of uh, situations. You, have, um, you can have free convection. Again, this is about convection. convection. Uh, you can have uh, various shapes. Hmm, not sure what that is here. Uh, it could be forced convection with a fan, for example. Uh, could be for air. Could be a natural convection with water, a film boiling, nucleate boiling, film condensation. Well, there are all sorts of situations. So when you design something <clears throat> and want to define which uh, edge uh, coefficient you are going to apply to your calculation, you look at what case matches your case. Now the last one is radiation. Again, we are not going to uh, uh, make radiation calculations in this uh, experiment, but um, just for for you to know um, what the theory behind that, and uh, it's not very uh, uh, in depth, but it gives a good idea of where we're coming from. These are slides from uh, Professor Salmaki. Uh, and radiation is an electromagnetic energy again, which is emitted from thermal agitation of molecules at surface. And a body that is impinged on by radiation undergoes reflection, absorption, and transmission at the same time. So here is a sketch. Uh, you've got an object. And so you've got some radiation which is going through, 
transmitted and uh, some radiation which is bouncing, reflecting on the object. It's like the light, really, uh, uh, the light or the uh, uh, infrared from the sun. You know, it's on an object. If the sun is low on the horizon, it will bounce on the object. If it's high here, right, it's, it's noon in the summer, there will be uh, much more absorption through it. And you also have losses, so it loses some because the air around is, maybe you may have a lot of sun and the air is cool, so you've got, as you, as you uh, uh, heat up the object by your radiation, it, it lo loses some, some, um, some energy. Anyway, here is the uh, heat added to the material formula. That factor here is the emissivity, absorptivity, absorptivity coefficient. And that's a, that's a diagram which is uh, very uh, common. You can find it everywhere where um, you've got um, here on the lower portion, you've got uh, the distribution of of uh, uh, wavelengths and their corresponding characteristic. So the visible light is in this range 380, 770 nanometer wavelengths. And Infrared, uh, which is the one causing mostly the heat here, is in this range. Microwaves, as you increase the wavelengths. X-rays, as you decrease. And here you've got the radiation of a black body at several color temperature. So tables exist that would uh, tell us what the, uh, the emissivity or absorptivity coefficient epsilon is. And here are those tables. Here is the formula. Again, we're not going to spend much time on that right now. Now, continuing with our general explanation of, of U, um, they, and we are nearly there, um, and that's the first law of energy balance. We already in a previous slide have, had, uh, have seen some of that, but <clears throat> what we wanted to stress here is that uh, you know, when you have heat going through uh, walls here, the pipe wall, that heat, and that's the energy balance here, that heat Q F here is equal to the heat that goes through the wall, equal to the heat that is produced by the convection on one side, here on the hot water side, and equal to the the heat tra heat transferred uh, uh, through that uh, caused by that convection on the cold water side. So this is what that first law uh, of energy balance is saying here. Qf here again is equal to Qh is equal to Qc. 
is equal to QO. Um, QO is conductive. It's conducting through the, the copper of the tube, the material. And QH is convective. So it's the importance of the convection as well. You see, if you have less convection, you are the more convection you have, the more heat exchange you have. And so um, here as a recap, here are the different um, uh, formulas involved for each one of the cases. So again, our uh, fluid to being transferred from the hot side, the uh, inner pipe to the outer pipe of our uh, very simple heat exchanger uh, is going through a convective phase first and goes through the wall, through conduction and then in convection again on the other side, on the cold water side. Here's the conclusion to our explanation of where you comes from. Um, well, it's, um, it's all about convective heat transfer coefficients as well. There is an analogy between our, our resistance, uh, electrical resistance and uh, thermal resistance, which is shown here. So here you've got that convection, here you've got that conduction through the wall and convection. They are all resistance, they resist. And uh, the U and the resistance, yeah, by conductance, it's a uh, one divided by conductance. Those factors here you saw here here, here, all those are shown here. And U is one over each one of these resistance. So, again, you've got that resistance, RH, RW resistance through the wall, RC is resistance due to the, the conduction on the other side of the wall, conduction, conductivity, Convection, convection, conduction, convection. So H here is the convected heat transfer coefficient on one side of the wall. H H. H C is the same thing, it's also um, convection on the other side of the wall and you've got K which is the thermal conductivity of the material through the wall here the length or the thickness of the wall and again remember this is where U comes from It's just a summary slide. That's probably the, the snapshot to keep in mind all the time during your career, is that all those cues are equal.
if you're not considering losses, this is what it is here. We got that Q, which is uh, MC, M order CP delta T, equal to that Q on the hot water side, MCP delta T, equal to that Q here, which is the energy transferred from the uh, hot fluid to the cold fluid. You recognize the U, and this Q is the same. Q is called the heat transfer rate, and you remember is heat transfer coefficient. But keep in mind this. Another extremely important uh, uh, concept formula to calculate uh, heat exchange, heat transfer, is the uh, is using calculating the log mean temperature difference or LMTD. The uh, LMTD is the uh, driven driven force for the heat exchange between the two fluids, and when the uh, LMTD value increases the amount of heat transfer between the two fluids also increase. And it's, LMTD is used for calculating the heat duty of the heat exchanger. And these are the formula. There are two different formulas for the LMTD, uh, counter flow or parallel flow. It's important that uh, you be careful because we are uh, uh, careful using the, the proper one because we are going to deal again with two different um, configuration in our experiment, counter flow and parallel flow. So they are different. And the LMTD is the uh, logarithmic average of the temperature difference between the hot and cold streams at each end, each end of the exchanger. So here I put some uh, little sketches showing those configuration of uh, counter flow here and parallel flow here. So counter that LMTD will apply to this one, this one, will apply to this one. Another thing you will have to calculate as well is a heat transfer area A, which is part of the calculations, um, typical calculation of a heat exchanger. In our case, we have that configuration of having um, a tubular heat exchanger with concentric tubes. So here are the actual dimensions of the piping involved in the uh, construction of uh, our heat exchanger in the lab. So you've got that on your handout as well. You can refer to it for your calculation. Um, it's, uh, you'll have to convert that into a metric system here. Into the SI units, sorry. So that's the formula given for calculating the heat transfer area A. Just need to use this. And here is a calculation that's uh, looking at your handout. It's part of what you will have to calculate as well the heat transfer effectiveness. As I mentioned earlier, it's never, we know heat exchanger is perfect. So you'll never have 100%. Uh, but here the, the goal is to compare the effectiveness of the counter flow as opposed to the, here, as opposed, um, to the parallel flow. So let's see which one is more effective. Uh, 
Um, we put here a representation. It's a diagram of the of the test system we are using in the lab. Um, quick description. Here is our heat exchanger. As I think I mentioned before, there are two legs. So don't forget in your calculation to make sure you take into account that the heat exchanger is this heat exchanger plus this heat exchanger. The whole length is this plus this. Now that is uh, describing the parallel flow mode. Here, as we, uh, this is how we set up that uh, heat exchanger. We put some cold water from the tap. It's pretty cold right now. And so uh, it's, uh, the cold water is injected here. And we also injected it, injected hot water uh, coming from a specific outlet in the wall of the lab with spray hot water um, and so the if we follow the hot water first you know it's injected here hose connected to that the valve and here the uh, the here the um, how the uh, hot water goes into the heat exchanger so following this we need to open that valve need to open that valve and then it goes to this um, this flow meter. It's a hot water flow meter. And so to adjust the flow, we just move that valve slightly um, to chart the flow and adjust it to one GPM. So the hot water goes into the outer tube which is a shell of the heat exchanger that's a hot water goes here gets out of the first leg goes here and finally goes to the drain here so now the the cold water and uh, this one is set up again for parallel flow the cold water is connected here Here is a flow meter for the cold water. So using that valve, we are going to adjust the flow to one GPM. And following the line, we need to open that valve. Goes here or here. Could go this way or this way. So anyway, we go this way because we want it parallel flow and we open that valve and make sure that valve remain closed closed and at this point we get into the inner tube of the heat exchanger keep on going go back in the inner tube and go this way this valve must be open that one must be closed that one must be closed and we send a cold water that has now been heated some thanks to the hot water again this is a heat exchanger we need that water coming out here at a higher temperature than it was here so that's uh, what it is now um they are to read the temperature because we have two things to read here we have um Make sure we have a flow uh, of water that we can read. So again, this one was set up set at uh, one GPM. This one's set also at one GPM. Um, now we need to read the temperature. Flow and temperatures are what are going to allow us to uh, calculate the uh, energy transferred. So that device here is just. Uh, uh, selector with a display a sort of control box here you read the temperature here you select which thermocouple you want to uh, read the temperature from so um, 
that. The turbocouples are shown in, in green. So you've got T1, T2, uh, I'm not sure if this is T3 or T4, T5, T6. So they are located at those points. And again, you can read the temperatures here. Counter flow mode now. Uh, so, well, as you see, it's not shown. We ask you to, uh, well, trace that, trace the path of hot water and cold water to show the, the counter flow mode. Um, you can uh, um, submit that with your report. You know, you just mark it with some crayon with colors and, and then uh, take a picture of it and put it on your report or Put the picture on the side up to you but it would be great if you could do something similar than that but this one was parallel flow mode for this counter flow mode the cold water inlet and hot water inlet is the same there is no change same same thing regarding where it goes out think about opening the valve which valve must be open, which valve must remain closed. So we can see counter flow mode. Experiment instructions, I'm not going to uh, do a lot here. We if I talk about that, it's on your handout. Um, and anyway, we have, because of the remote classes, we have done that ourselves. But just look at it to uh, see uh, what it would have been like if you had to do it yourself. Position of thermocouples um, in order to facilitate the identification in your spreadsheet where you have to do the calculation. Um, this is our, they are named T1 here, T2, T3, T4, T6, T5. That's for references, for reference purposes. Here's the data sheet that uh, you have to fill up. We uh, provided that in your handout. Um, we provided what we saw, what we re the, the reading of the different um, thermocouples, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. Note that T7, T8 do not exist. Not sure why they are still on that data sheet. We have also provided the diameter of the inner pipe and the length over which heat transfer occurs, which is the length of the two sections, two legs of the heat exchanger. Flow rates here are one GPM for both. And uh, as your adult is indicating it, you have to and draw or label a graph, or it can be, uh, it would be on your spreadsheet likely if you use Excel. So here you've got the lengths. Remember, um, the lengths of the heat exchanger is two lengths. We have two legs. So that's the length is for the two legs. Temperature and same for the reverse flow. And you should find something that looks like this, just to give you a hint. If you don't find something that looks like that, it's not, something's wrong. And um, the calculations, and uh, <clears throat> that's why we went through all that preliminaries and presentation. We, uh, you, we have to calculate the heat transfer rate for the hot water, Q hot, heat transfer rate for the cold water, Q cold. And remember, there should be correlation here. There probably will not be very much correlation because of uh, the summer couples need to be calibrated. They are probably not extremely precise, but still we should have a, an order of magnitude and should be looking similar. And uh, you need to calculate, because of that formula, you need to calculate delta T, delta T LMTD, logarithmic, and uh, eventually you remember because of
Here are the deliverables. Uh, please submit uh, an Excel sheet with uh, calculation and three graphs uh, to show your results as indicated here. Uh, parallel flow temperature profile, hot and cold, reverse flow temperature profiles, hot and cold, and plot the temperature using scattered plot. It um, provide a column graph comparing heat transfer effectiveness in parallel and reverse flow. And thank you, that's uh, concluding this uh, lecture. Uh, to present our lab, please read your handout carefully and do not hesitate to contact uh, Professor Starbird or myself for any question. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.